John, I'm going to start with a question for you, please. Which is that, uh, so you, talk, you touched on regulation as being a, a sort of a challenge and, and something that's, that's increasing uh, within the UK. Uh, the question is, if people are trying to bring new products into the market, how can they do that in a, a regulatory environment that seems set up to stop them? Gosh, it's a, bit, it's a bit like being in a firing range here, actually. You feel as if you're sort of... I mean, no. There is, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering the question right. There is a regulatory system for bringing uh, products to the market, okay? Uh, and that is currently, I think today is still right, it's a European, yeah. European system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but interesting enough, if, if when we leave Europe, they're going to copy and paste, by and large, the way it's done to the UK, at least initially. So essentially, there's a European scheme. The, the, the fact is that probably the regulatory scheme in Europe is without doubt the most strict, or the strictest in the world, really. So it, it, as Peter, I think, I think it was Peter who alluded to it, it costs an awful lot of money to actually get a product through that scheme. I mean, we're talking a lot of money, a lot of millions. And this is part of the problem when you come to amenity, because you might think your market is really very, very important. But in terms of comparing it with other markets, such as agriculture, it's quite a small, small market. So the, the answer is, though, is that the, the process is there. What, what, what people like, we've got Bayer in the room, or Syngenta's or whatever, what they've got to do is they've got to work out the risk and say, well, this is going to cost X to try and get there. Once, once you've then got that active approved, you then get the product authorised, and that's done in the UK. So the UK then authorise the product, but they can't authorise the product until you get the active. So I hope I'm not, people have not lost people. So essentially, getting the active authorised through Europe, sorry, approved through Europe, and then the product getting authorised in the UK. Have I got that right, Peter? You've got that right. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, if you pass the microphone across to Minshad. So, Steve, can I just? Yes. Say something on that. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, just to follow up on what John said, um, I, th I don't, I don't see there being a major problem with products being brought into the environment. The people at all the various companies are very, very clever. They, they understand the change regulation. They adapt and they bring them through. The biggest change is in the understanding that the uh, the practitioner and then whatever the end user is, is what a new product actually can achieve. Yes compared to what products used to achieve. Um, we now talk about control. Peter beautifully described it as a managed kill, and, and nowadays it's, it's not even a managed kill in some cases. It's a managed sort of slap around the face, go away for a bit, as opposed to, to what we used to do when we applied a product and, and cured the problem. Um, I'm not sure that all green keepers have, have understood that, that the new products being brought to market by a lot of the people in this room are not as efficacious um, um, as, as they used to be, but they're as efficacious as we're going to get. Uh, and so we've got to learn to manage in that environment and we've got to communicate to those that are then using the facilities that that is now what good looks like. Um, good looks like healthy turf being yeah. managed as well as we can as opposed to some kind of perfection which your bosses would like you to achieve, Phil, but actually is, is almost impossible in the current <coughs> uh, regulatory environment. Okay, I'm going to actually put the next question to Phil in that case because uh, it, it, it comes on from there. So, Phil, what if you had to compare your experience of using chemicals with your experience of using nematodes, just very briefly, what would you say are the major differences between the two? Well, <laughs> the, the chemical is the, is the quick fix, isn't it? But the, nem the nematode isn't. Um, you, you can't rely on time. You know, this is a three-year approach for us to sort this program out. It's not a one fixed wonder. Um, the costs are, are similar, a little bit less than what Merit was, but the time and commitment you need to success with political program is much more intensive. And it's, it's basically it. Yeah, Thank you very much. But well I think this does come back to the, the, the point you mentioned quick fix. I don't I don't think there are any quick fixes anymore. Do you, do you remember yeah. that I said that everybody's looking for a magical solution but none of you believe in magic. I think it is all about an integrated approach now. What we've got to do is we've got to understand and I thought that last presentation was 
excellent in fact because what it was bringing together this is this isn't that there are no quick fixes this is now a situation we've got to get back to basics and really understand everything about what we're doing and that that is going to take quite an investment in training i think sorry Peter, did you do that absolutely yeah thank you question for you richard yeah so richard people have been using chemicals for hundreds of years do you believe the industry is actually ready to accept a move to more biological solutions? Very good. That's okay. Yes, <laughs> I think uh, things are changing where I'm seeing um, <clears throat> after 2016. So um, since then, um, uh, there is no chemical, and uh, I don't know if there any chemical is going to come in the, in the future. So whether they like or not, but uh, they need to find other way of the tackling this problem. And then problem was outlined today uh, as a part of integrated pest management. I'm always a firm believer uh, of using in combination with other approach, such as the low dose chemical, which can actually um, accelerate uh, nematode or other uh, efficacy. So this is one of uh, uh, the part of the IPM as well. So for example, we developed uh, MET52 in 2009 with Noazine, and I advise actually to apply nematode uh, three weeks later and where the strawberry growers are actually uh, uh, were able to control 100% bind behavior. So it's all about the IPM. How industry is going to accept, I think it's very difficult how quickly they learn. It's still uh, the slide which I showed this morning, uh, basically is frightening. Um, how this is going to go widely, um, how many people are actually going to see this one. So uh, uh, if we do a lot of, uh, I mean, joint efforts, the industry come together, we organize a few course, a few things, a few similar events, I think we will be able to do more better job than what I have done today. Okay, thank you very much. Go please. Yeah, I mean, particularly on that one is we talk about biological control. Actually, it's what we're doing is at a biological level. So in order to control anything, we are ultimately upsetting its biology. Whether it's biological, chemical, conventional, whatever you want to call it, the net result is the same thing. Because the biological product is actually, it's chemical warfare out there. The reason things survive in this environment is because they're able to outcompete other things. So I think there's a lot of education on the public, and that's a real challenge, is actually what do we mean when we talk about biological control. We are still using chemicals. It's just that those chemicals don't necessarily get made in a big industrial plant. Those chemicals, I mean, a bit like the, uh, the garlic products, are actually extracted from natural products. So the net effect is no different. And actually, some of the most toxic things known to man are biological. Uh, Botox, if you put an LD50 scale up on here, you'd get no pesticides on there because you wouldn't be able to see them. They'd be so low down there that you wouldn't be able to see them. So I think there is a lot of education of everybody, which is easy to say, but incredibly challenging to do. That's right, hold on to the microphone, yours is next. <laughs> so, uh, so obviously Rigby Taylor sell you know, thousands of products. Um, one of the uh, questions is, how do you see um, products working together uh, Sort of, it's not just individual products being sold. You know, how do you advise people to combine products, I guess? Well, the key thing there is actually using science because, uh, as you're probably aware, Ruby Taylor is part of the largest crop protection group in Europe. Uh, the business is actually handling somewhere just short of a half a billion pounds worth of crop protection products. That's both uh, UK conventional and biological. So what we have to do is actually utilize the benefits of all of the things available to us. If you're a Mr. Bayer or a Mr. Syngenta, you'll be wanting to develop your proprietary products. The role for the Ricky Taylors in this world is to actually take the best of both and get the synergies out between those products. And that's not just the physical products, but it's also <coughs> using the biology, using the genotypes, using the right crop and the right seed varieties, the right nutrition, etc. So it isn't simple, so it is classic integrated approach, as we've talked about many times today. Sure. Just to, just to add uh, what Peter said about, I mean, the one example I gave you 
compatibility with nematode and I haven't gone through uh, insecticide, fertilizer, uh, so many products are actually being sold to this industry. If I tell you some of the fact, uh, which is actually frightening, uh, though I think in more research will be needed uh, if the product comes for uh, combination that can be applied as well. So I think the question can be asked, uh, uh, does it work uh, alongside uh, or, or is there any negative impact or you know. So this is very important to find out before even you recommend X product uh, combined with Y. Um, and uh, our finding showed very frightening results, uh, which we tested 30 different kind of weighting agents, and uh, the 10% will kill straight away nematodes. And unfortunately, these 10% nematodes are already sold by the industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to say a couple of the speakers today, um, and a couple of the organizations here, have specifically said that one of the things that they would like to do is to deliberately go out of their way to, to collaborate ac across industry. Um, so, if you get a chance to speak to um, the, the guys from uh, EcoSpray, uh, Bionema have said it, uh, Maxim have said it, uh, Emark, <laughs> yeah, there, is, there is an appetite to collaborate. So, uh, please you know, don't just sort of walk away today and think, oh, I wish I'd had a chance to speak to them. Uh, they're here and they would like to talk to you. Is that, yeah? That's the okay, great, thank you. Um, question for you, Mr. Um, if you, you talked about cold being a problem um, for, for applying nematodes um, if, if it was too cold, um, but yet you say that you supply them, you, you supply them frozen or, or, or chilled. Chilled. Um, that, that was the question, Steve. No. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, hang on. <coughs> the question was: Is that you made the statement with reference to cold temperatures? The chambers will go down and up. And then there's the issue with reference to chafers disrupting their life cycle being cold. Uh, I've actually thrown chafers, well, not me personally. We took a number of chafers out of a lawn in Liverpool and took them to a company that was supplying us with a product that didn't work. And he threw them in the freezer for three weeks, minus 15 degrees. Took them out, defrosted, and they just crawled across the table. Um, so where do we go when we've got that sort of issue? We're doing this too long, you see. <laughs> The nematodes, as I explained this morning, have a limitation as well. So some nematode works at uh, low temperature, as I said, the 8 degree, but there is other nematode exists in the uh, horticulture industry which can work 0 degree, 1 degree, 2 degree. Uh, that product actually is very successful in the horticulture industry. We don't have, unfortunately, a product which can work in the low temperature, for example, uh, so, uh, which can work in January, February. And again, the behavior, the one you are talking about, going up and down, it is very difficult. So we know this one, and that's the reason we don't recommend uh, uh, nematode application in January, February, until the soil temperature become more than 10 degrees centigrade. So there is a very strictly instruction written there, store at uh, 5 to 10 degree temperature, apply when the soil temperature is more than 10 or more than 12 or more than 14 degree temperature. Okay, thank you. Okay, last chance. Anybody uh, in the room with a with a question before I ask the final one to every member of the panel? Yeah, yeah. Peter, hang on. Yeah. We have an odd question. It's directed to Phil. We heard um, Kate mention earlier today about the cho choice of grass types for you know integrated management, and with your teas at the grove, predominantly fescue. I think the guy from Neath predominantly fescue, of course. I know your greens aren't fescue, but no, would you no. say that the <laughs> fescue areas, <laughs> fescue areas were the worst, or the worst areas you've got on the golf course for? Yeah, it was a big decision really what what to return the teas with. Um, we're quite a dry site, and um, the majority of the fairways were surviving in fescue in low water. Um, we didn't want the, the teas to be emerald green. Um, that was most of the reason why, but we are overseeding ryegrass into the, the weak gold teas. Um, I don't think that grasses really affect no. the, the, where the grubs are, because um, we've had ryegrass areas affected. Um, there's two down the bottom holes, we've got rye grass holes, and the top holes, we've got fleshy holes, different soil. Um, and they're everywhere, they're not just in one particular fescue or rye area. Um, we've got rye grass fairways that are 
destroy totally. We had to turn off about 15 pallets. So it was more a look aesthetic wise that we didn't want to have rye grass teas grown out of control. Like that. Answers. But okay. you know, trusting Mingsha, you know, gives me these boxes of packs of nematodes, and how, how do you know there's 500,000 in a pack? Did you count them in shadow? <laughs> yeah, so, <clears throat> so I, I think this is, this is interesting. And uh, again, education comes here as well. The training and education is very important. Just taking little quantity, putting in the water, or, uh, you know, petrodis, and uh, using hand lens 20 times magnifying. I think it's an easy to way uh, to just see whether they are straightened or they are curved. If they are straight, which means they are dead. If they are actually um, firm, which means they are not dead. So this is a, a, a very basic indication uh, the gamekeepers or MD user can get this one. Um, if there is any problem, we always promise that you return the pack and we will replace with the new one. But it doesn't come always. So it's always like fresh product we provide. So people are ordering on Friday, they get the product by Tuesday. Great, thank you. Thank you all to the panelists. So uh, I'm just gonna take a leaf out of John's book at the, he said uh, that if it's a good conference, you'll remember one thing. If it's a brilliant conference, you'll remember two. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna go down the, uh, the row, ask uh, each of the panelists to, to say one thing that will count as a good outcome and a second thing that will count as a brilliant outcome uh, so that you can, you can leave with those uh, things ringing in your mind. There's a final, there is a final bullet point. I can do that later on. Okay. So if you, if you pass the microphone to Jim. <coughs> Thanks, Steve. Hospital pass. <coughs> um, <laughs> I've been asleep for most of it. Um, <laughs> it's far too technical for me. Um, so I'm an optimist, and um, I feel that this situation, this specific situation, but the, the broader situation of the climate, the, the, the broad climate in which uh, turf is now managed, and that's not just the, the weather climate, but the environmental climate, the regulatory climate, etc., is, is great news for IOG and bigger, um, and it's potentially great news for our members. Phil won't necessarily agree with me because you've had a pretty tough few years dealing with this, but the, the job of our associations and the job of all the people in this room that are on, on this is to demonstrate to employers and the industry that, that we're not just grass cutters. And grass cutters couldn't have done what Phil and Mark have done over the last few years at their, at their venues. This is a very, very complicated situation and turf management has gone from, I'm not sure, I said this on the video earlier on, um, I'm not sure it's ever been one dimensional, but I think people have tried to pretend it's one dimensional. Um, this is not a criticism of any, any current uh, sellers in the room, but it used to be, you know, use this, it'll work. Um, and and those, those days are gone. And the thing I've taken away most from today is that the good turf management is a jigsaw, a really quite complicated jigsaw. Um, and that the skill is in the purchaser, the skill is in the purchaser and the applier to filter all the information that's out there, to listen to the things that have come from today. I think we've got a job to do in trying to pre the information from today. I know you're going to try and make some of the videos available so we can direct people yeah. to them. But I'd, I've not taken the message from anybody today, I hope I've not missed the point, that this is the silver bullet. In fact, lots of people have said there isn't one. What they've said is there's a whole bunch of different guns in here, and if you, if you use them correctly together with a lot of water, um, <laughs> you, you, you may well um, get there. And I, and I think that uh, whether that's a good thing or a brilliant thing, the, the thing to me that I, I really take from this is that uh, Mark, you know, very happily saying, in his presentation that a reduction in population of his <coughs> particular groups of about two thirds was really good, really happy with that. That's just, I mean, I've only been involved in this industry for about eight years, that's a massive change to think that a whole sports turf industry has got to reassess its horizons completely from kill to control and manage. Um, and I think that's a message we've got to take. No pressure, Karen over there as head of communications for your organization and Carl from, from mine, but we've got to get that message out that it's about control and manage, not about decimate and kill. Um, and it's a complicated process. Um, okay, on the spot. Um, for, for me, going through that, that journey, the last 11 years, from having chemicals that were there, chemicals are not there, more pests, more diseases. Um, for me, it's educating ourselves and getting people to understand you know, what we can do, think a bit differently, help each other out. You know, people are not or too afraid to ask questions or too proud to ask questions. Or, or, you know, we're all in industry together, so we just need to 
if we can pull together and help each other out would be my biggest biggest thing. You know, when I, when I was told I was doing nematodes, when I found out I was doing nematodes, everyone was saying, that ain't gonna work, that ain't gonna work. I said, well, you gotta give it a go. What other choice do you have? You, know, you can't have dead turf and, you know, thousands, thousands of pounds of damage on your golf course and guests, you know, complaining. Re reputation and business and we've got to do what we can. So, well, if I can help, I'm, I'm delighted. Give a bigger discount. <laughs> Being in industry for long, um, not for a long time, I'm in the turf and industry is my like last five years. I'm talking with um, agronomist uh, and, and end user um, and also the salesman. I think what I see and I want to do actually to collaborate with IUG, uh, Bega or any other organization who want to come and join hand, how to educate uh, end user, uh, which I want to do really. Uh, uh, it, it's very difficult. Uh, this will be <coughs> same scenario if we don't do anything because they are not getting the right message. And how to get the right message, I think I'm not able to do alone. We have uh, 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 some other uh, things to do, but I think uh, if we have a support from the big IUG, I think uh, there is a way where we can organize a few more uh, conferences or something like this um, and uh, to educate um, end user. I think that's where they move forward. The second thing I want to do, uh, there are a lot of products there in the market, how we can see the synergy between the two products. I have done a lot of uh, research in this area as uh, um, Nicholas uh, pointed that uh, garlic product um, followed by the six weeks of the nematode application. I think this could well work because of the stress factor. So when the insect are stressed, they are more uh, susceptible to nematode. I have done this one with uh, amidacloprid, I have done with chloroperifos, I have done with uh, fipronol, I have done with many other insecticide in horticulture sector. And in those cases, we reduce a chemical by 90% in horticulture. So there is a possibility here, more looking in, into detail, how actually we can combine them uh, in order to exploit the results, not just uh, desperation uh, is that I want to use this one, I want to use this one, I want to use, I think this is only going to be the education from my point of view, um, and that's what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, you know, it's hospital plus, when you get here, you really have to think. Uh, I mean, I think there's, there's lots of things, I mean, integrated, whatever. I, I actually would like to just have one message for everybody, though, and that's about communication. We've not got to just communicate within ourselves. We've got to communicate to the owners of our golf courses or cricket clubs or whatever. We've got to communicate to the public because this is a huge challenge. And you've got used to being used, using the bottle or whatever it may be. The public have got to recognise and all the owners have got to recognise this is now a complex task. And it's, you know, I, I get people who say to me, it's your job, John, to convince all the politicians. Or, it's everybody. You've all got people you can talk to. And I think there's a huge job here about how we communicate this to everyone about this issue and how we've got to look at things. And in fact, the reason we're doing this is because, as Peter said, we're, we're, we're not, you know, chemicals run our life, don't they, Peter? I mean, we've got, you know, if, if, by the way, if you think pesticides are dangerous, look under your kitchen sink. Um, what I'm saying to you is, however, it's about managing the biology and we can get the people on side. We can get the public who are anti on side if we demonstrate what we're doing and why we're doing it in that way. So communication is my big message, really, for everyone. Okay, now the real hospital pass. But yeah, uh, that's it. Yeah. I mean, certainly for me, I think a key objective is actually understand what we're doing, why we're doing it and also doing the right thing, the right time, and in the right place. Because if you put all of those together, then actually that'll be for the benefit of everybody that uh, these guys have mentioned. Thank you very much. Well, it, it leaves me to, uh, to thank all of you for coming, uh, for your engagement, for your uh, conversation, uh, for the collaboration and the networking that's been uh, taking place. I'm sure you'd also like to thank uh, me to thank all the speakers uh, that we've had today. A lot of them have put a lot of time and effort uh, into preparing for today and uh, for the panellists for being willing to put themselves right on the spot. I think it's fair to say that uh, you know, we've covered a lot of ground today. We've talked about awareness of the problem. Uh, we've talked, I think uh, Kate used the phrase, know your enemy. And uh, we've, we've had a lot of uh, information about some of these pests. 
A key message being, don't leave it until too late to actually get the treatment in place. And it's not a silver bullet. It's not a single kill it and walk away. This is about a program. It's about integrated pest management. It's about working together, as a, both as, as different manufacturing companies, different products, but also as an industry in terms of the communication, in terms of the professional standards that John talked about earlier on. And it's about knowing the processes because it's not just do it. It's about, you know, Phil and Mark both talked about a process of application and, and about managing it over a period of time. And the good news is that there are answers out there. So it's not just a question of giving up. It's a question of looking ahead positively, recognizing that there are solutions and that together we can address them. So once again, thank you very much. And, uh, Safe journey home.